<laughs> okay, welcome back. Great to see so many of you. Um, uh, we're moving on from a very exciting first panel. Um, I think uh, some of the strategic questions will come up again. Um, also, the, the question of uh, are these differences in degree, can we really think of a spectrum of liberal democracies? Is there a typology or, a, or varieties of democracies? Maybe that's something we can uh, try and answer or begin to answer when we're looking at different case uh, studies. And what we're basically doing is very geographical and very complementary. Uh, we're taking off in the east of Europe and uh, Elena Stavreska is going to give a talk about, um, well, candidate states and certain structural similarities. She's gonna draw on the examples of Hungary and Macedonia to think through, uh, well, the dangers uh, of, uh, of uh, liberal democracy. Elena is a postdoc here at BCB Unfortunately for us, she's going to leave us. Fortunately for her, she's going to go to uh, the University of Notre, uh, Notre Dame. She's a um, peace and uh, conflict studies uh, expert, and uh, she will start out with the uh, first presentation. Let me nonetheless uh, go on and quickly uh, <laughs> uh, delineate our itinerary that we're moving on to the south of Europe, and uh, John Hopkin from the uh, LSE, uh, from the Department of uh, Government, will uh, talk about, um, will put a focus on the South, will give us a sneak preview of what is going to become his book that he's currently writing. Uh, the title will be Anti-System Politics. The subtitle isn't quite clear yet, so maybe we can influence <laughs> it but, uh, if we ask the question. Illiberal, Illiberal democracy. Perhaps yeah. liberal democracy. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to fly on from the south of Europe to the north of Europe and take a comparison of which Christian is going to do, Christian Langert from the Freie Universität, from the John F. Kennedy Institute, and compare the US case to the European case. Um, and uh, Christian is the director of the um, John F. Kennedy Institute, and he also has the Department of Politics at, uh, at Freie Universität. So, uh, without further ado, let's move on. Thank you, Elena, and uh, let, join me in welcoming uh, the panelists. All right, um, so I will be talking about, um, about, well, actually, I'll be introducing a new concept, just because things are so simple right now. Um, I'll be introducing the concept of state capture, and I'll be particularly looking and talking about some similarities that we can actually see both in member states in uh, East Central Europe and in the candidate countries uh, for EU membership uh, in Southeast Europe, or what's, what some have called the Western Balkans. So I will be leaving Tur Turkey out of the whole discussion because, of, because there's a panel about it later on, actually. Um, when, when we talk about Hungary as the obvious culprit uh, of um, illiberal democracy, um, often people have asked, why doesn't the EU do something? It is, after all, a country that is a member of the EU, and actually it undermines EU's uh, influence and um, ability to, to conduct certain foreign policy, among other things. Um, so the EU enlargement has long been praised uh, as the most effective tool for democracy promotion, starting from Greece, Spain, and Portugal in the 80s, but particularly with the, uh, particularly with, uh, the enlargement towards the East, including the 10 uh, member states that joined in 2004 and 2007, those being the Baltic countries, plus the four Visegrad countries, um, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, um, Hungary and Poland, and then Bulgaria and Romania as well, uh, plus Slovenia. So um, this is something that some would argue EU scholars have made in careers <coughs> around, uh, the conditionality and the power of this conditionality that the EU holds. Um, it has been argued that that conditionality works as long as there's three conditions that are fulfilled. One is that uh, membership seems like an attractive reward for the necessary re reforms. The second is that those reforms come at a relatively low domestic political cost, uh, and that the membership is actually a credible option. What we have seen in the last 10 years, both in those countries that have joined and in the candidate <coughs> countries, is that this conditionality not only doesn't, no longer works for the candidate countries, but it can actually be reversed once inside. Um, Geographically, what I'm talking about, when I talk about the candidate countries here, I talk about those that already have candidate uh, status, those being Serbia, Montenegro, Macedonia, and Albania, and uh, the two countries 
uh, aiming towards uh, becoming candidates and then one day members, Bosnia and Kosovo. Uh, so I, my first, the first argument that I make on which I build the, the, the later arguments is that we actually see similarities in what some have called backsliding of democracy, what others have called new authoritarianism. Um, what here, and well not just here, but it has been termed also illiberal democracy in both member states and candidate countries and that there are similarities in how this, um, how this occurs. Um, so the similarity lies in something that um, has, in political science has been um, called state capture. And I'm introducing this term because I'm trying to uh, problematize this whole idea that there's only one type of illiberal democracy or one type of um, democracy, um, for that matter. State capture involves uh, a substantial institutionalized, and that's important, that this is not beyond the institutions, it's within the institutions, uh, self-interested and particularistic influence on policy making and policy implementation by a certain not often not rep a representative uh, group of actors. So in Hungary, this is not just Orban, even though we call, we, we tend to identify the regime with one person, uh, but it is the whole network of people who are not necessarily Fidesz members, party members, uh, but are people who have gotten not only rich, but have managed to also influence policy inside the country. The similar case was uh, in Macedonia during um, uh, Grunsky's regime, so state capture is, um, is not, it's important not to confuse it with corruption. Corruption is the potential, one of the outcomes, but state capture is actually by design, and uh, it is, it is, uh, all of these changes are actually done in a constitutional manner. So when we try to dismiss Hungary as not a democracy, let's not forget that the changes in the uh, constitutional court, the changes of the constitution for that matter, the changes in the electoral system, we're all done constitutionally. They're not outside the system, they're part of the system. Part of it is, what Bela Grishkovic has argued, is because of the way the system was designed in the first place. So it is hollow inside, which I can elaborate later on uh, more. Um, and this is where it runs contrary to liberal democracy in particular, and what uh, Robert Dahl has um, referred to as polyarchy, whereby policies, are usually <coughs> shaped, or they are assumed to be shaped, by multiple different actors who don't speak in one voice necessarily. And this is where we also run into this uh, contention of liberalism with state capture uh, as such. Um, two things are also important. Um, one is that this is often paired with restricted freedom of media. This is not necessarily done through um, imprisoning journalists or uh, threatening journalists even, uh, but actually it is done through the functioning of the market and the purchase of independent media by those who are close to the regime. <coughs> so the silencing of, uh, of opposition voices is done in a manner that is not necessarily unconstitutional. Um, and a second thing is that this occurs usually in societies with low trust in institutions. This is something that even Krasnik has long highlighted, uh, that now, now we see this in the West as well, but for, for, for decades we have seen this in um, post-communist societies, where the trust in institutions and in the state are very low. Um, the state capture runs on this complex uh, system of uh, clientelistic system by employing um, people in public institutions, by employing members, um, in everything where the state has influence. Um, therefore, helping st those citizens uh, cope with the uncertainty and the anxiety that comes with the system as, as is. This is something that we have to consider when we, when, when we talk about illiberal democracies. Where does it come from and how does it run? How, how is it sustained? Because even without the changes, it has been argued that even without the changes in the constitution and without the changes in the electoral system uh, in Hungary, Viktor Orban and Fidesz would have still won in the latest, and with a, major, a large majority, in the latest um, elections. Because when faced with the question of whether you will keep your job or you can choose whom to vote for, 
you will rather choose the, the first one. Particularly, as I said, in this society where for decades there has been such a uh, low level of trust. So the legitimacy of, this, of these regimes, of both regimes um, that I talk about as, as examples, but this is not only the case in Hungary and Macedonia, but we also see it in Czech Republic now, um, we see it in Poland, evidently. We see it to a certain extent in Bulgaria, um, Romania in the past, not so much anymore, um, Serbia, Kosovo, Montenegro, and so on. So one aspect of the, this legitimacy comes from what I already said, promise for economic <coughs> growth. Never mind the fact that um, a recent study has shown that without the EU funds, the economic growth in Hungary will be very, very minimal. Nevertheless, Orban has delivered on the promise of economic growth. Um, <coughs> the second is defense of the nation, whoever uh, the other might be. You can see a similarity here as well, whether that's refugees, whether in the case of Macedonia is um, the Greeks who are trying to take Alexander the Great and this whole history of, um, uh, well, the whole history surrounding uh, him and um, that rule. Um, and sometimes defense of the nation from the EU, but you will notice that discursively, this is not the EU as a whole. It is EU and certain policies of the EU. Um, so for instance, in the case of uh, Hungary, the EU is not always bad. It's only bad when it tries to impose a certain immigration uh, um, resettlement quota on Hungary. In the case of Macedonia, the EU is not always bad. To the contrary, the EU is good, but it is bad because it backs uh, Greece in this whole main dispute um, that has been lasting for a while and that has blocked Macedonia's um, EU membership. And this, the third aspect from where legitimacy comes, I argue, is the association with the EU. This comes from the membership in the case of those who are already in. In the case of the candidate countries, it comes from progress reports. If you read the EU progress reports, I mean, technical language aside, they can easily be uh, spinned in a manner that it seems that there is actual progress. Uh, for years, for years, the European Commission has been suggesting, even at the height of Gruszki's regime in Macedonia, the EU Commission has been suggesting uh, negotiation for negotiations to start, which then obviously in domestic media is presented as the country making any progress, even though it has been backsliding on all fronts. Uh, and the third aspect is funds. I already mentioned this in the case of Hungary. But it is not only um, the cohesion policy funds. It is also different funds that are available to, uh, m uh, to candidate countries. These funds, even though somewhat under the radar, are actually very, a substantial part of the, of, of the economies of both the member states and the candidate countries. Now, where, why I say that this legitimacy also comes from the association with the EU is when you look at the support for the EU um, that um, these countries have. You see that Poland is actually, despite all the problems, Poland is actually the highest, uh, the, the country with the highest support for the EU. Uh, Hungary, very high as well. This, is, this was a, um, a survey done after the Brexit vote. And you see that after the Brexit vote, when some countries had actually argued that they also need a referendum to decide, both in Poland and in Hungary, the support for the EU not only is high, it had actually increased. In 2017, this is, among others, a year also when uh, the issue of uh, refugee resettlement was also very, um, a very, played a very prominent role in the public discourse there. This is from Macedonia done in um, 2015, in the midst of the, of, of the highest, well, the most severe political crisis in the country. But you see that, that the lowest, that the support for um, EU membership ever, has ever gotten is 72, which is very, very high. Usually it's in the 90s. The, sem the similar picture, uh, the picture, uh, the, the percentages are similar across the Western Balkans, so across um, candidate countries. Therefore, there is legitimacy by these countries maintaining the relationship and association with the EU, despite of whatever is done on the domestic political front. There are some constraints, though, and these are not often talked about. So I, I argue that uh, it is through two different institutions, one of which is EU institution and the other one is not, um, and the jurisprudence, that uh, the EU has actually also played a role of a constraint. 
That's why this dual role that I, I talk about. So one is the European Court of Justice, uh, where the European Commission, which has a little bit more freedom than um, the, 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 the Council and, or the other um, institutions, um, where the European Commission has uh, brought cases against Poland and Hungary. But the other more important one uh, is the European Council, uh, European Court of Human Rights, which is a Council of uh, Europe court. The EU has an influence there as well which has ma managed to actually preserve certain human rights. Therefore, no matter how, how far the backsliding of democracy goes here, it can never sunk below a certain, uh, a certain level, which is Im embedded in some of the decisions um, uh, by, by these two courts. The Hungarian Constitutional Court, um, even though it has been, similarly with the, with the Polish Constitutional Court, even though the membership there has been um, largely um, overhauled in favor of Fidesz supporting judges, even they would not only would, but never do go against any of the decisions of these two courts. So it, when in 2016, there was a case in front of the European Court of Human Rights to protect human rights and certain freedoms. Uh, and th the court ruled against Hungary of course, the Hungarian courts had to actually implement the decisions. Um, again, this is something that usually actually is not much talked about in the political, um, in, in the mainstream discourse anyways. So therefore, I argue that the EU has this dual role. Both it plays a constraint, an ultimate constraint. Um, the, the European Court of Human Rights, by the way, uh, decisions are also implemented in um, candidate countries. So the EU plays a dual role whereby, on one hand, uh, it provides legitimacy for these uh, regimes to continue doing whatever they're doing. But at the same time, it also plays the ultimate constraint of democracy not sinking below, below, a, certain, uh, and, and, uh, below a certain level. And for that matter, um, so, well, defense of human rights or, or um, uh, the human rights in the country overall. So where does this dual role come from and where, where does that leave us? Uh, the dual role comes from the EU, EU's institutional setup. Um, one is the European Council or the Council of Ministers, which actually fears precedents quite a bit. Who is to say that tomorrow a similar case or a similar um, behavior will not happen against another candidate country, uh, sorry, another, another member of the state. Um, therefore, there's this whole notion that we, we, have to, um, we have to preserve the sovereignty of the country, but also to protect ourselves from potentially someone undermining our sovereignty one day as well. Um, that is as far as members go. As far as candidate countries go, there's a concern with the stability on the periphery. At the highest uh, point of, um, of the political crisis in Macedonia, you had uh, people like Sebastian Kurz, who is now the, uh, the, the Prime Minister of Austria, at that time Foreign Minister, coming and actually speaking at a rally of someone who everyone had consi considered to be an authoritarian figure. You had uh, representatives from Hungary doing so. This was also the time of the refugee crisis. So they needed to maintain Serbia, Macedonia, Albania, Bosnia stable to the best of their ability so that there's no overflow. This was before the Turkey um, and the Turkey agreement uh, over the refugees. So one, one aspect of this dual role is this uh, role played by the European Council or Council of Ministers. The second one is the role played by the European Parliament. It has been argued that uh, the democratic deficit that the EU has often been blamed about is actually not so much about the democracy inside the EU, but about what that enables in the countries themselves. So in the European Parliament, there's, as you probably know, or maybe not, um, there are different parliamentary groupings that bring together um, sister parties on, on the different um, sides of the political spectrum. One of them is the European People's Party, uh, which has been attacked quite a bit um, for providing an umbrella or a shield for Orban, um, for, for, for both the leading parties in Hungary, Poland, um, but also in candidate countries. Even though those parties are actually not members of the European People's Party, they're only associate members, they have been shielded off 
from much of criticism or any action that the European Parliament might suggest um, moving forward. So we are left with actually the European Commission and the European Courts as the only, um, only institutions that have some wiggle room to do any kind of action um, in, in preserving democracy, let's, let, let, let's call it that. Uh, one is, as I said, the European Commission through the progress reports. The language has changed now a little bit, but not significantly, not enough. Uh, the budget uh, framework in the EU generally is for about 10 years, and it is not very flexible. So it is only now that the European Commission is starting to talk about uh, redirecting funds from those members that might not respect, or mm, where there might not be rule of law, there might be rule by law. Um, but that will not happen until 2021. So there's slowness in the process, but it is one of the only institutions where anything can be done. Uh, and the fourth one, um, the, only, the, the only aspect for saving grace, um, so to say, are the European courts. Uh, so where does this leave us? There's good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is that the EU actually cannot do much, not in the short term, um, to um, to pres well, to to discourage illiberal democracy or state capture from happening. Uh, at the same time, um, the e in the long run, the EU can do several things. One is work through the courts. The second is uh, redirect funds, uh, and the third one is um, remove the assumption in the Copenhagen criteria for membership but also in some of the, the legal framework that exists, that uh, the assumption that uh, uh, certain democratic institutions by themselves are enough, uh, regardless of them actually being shell of institutions most of the time. So on that not very positive note, um, I will end. Um, and we can talk more later. So thanks, Boris, for uh, um, flagging the fact that I'm involved in the book project. And um, what I'm going to talk about now is, is uh, a, a slice of that. Um, so uh, the title is Anti-System Politics. I guess some of what uh, we've been talking about so far is illiberal democracy, or what is often referred to as populism, falls into that category. But not only. So I'm, I actually see that as being part of a broad push against uh, market liberalism which can take different forms, can take a sort of illiberal democracy or populist, right-wing populist form, but it can also take a, a left anti-capitalist form. Um, and Southern Europe is the best example of that, of that latter form. So in a way, I mean, I hadn't really thought of this while preparing my talk, but in coming straight after uh, looking at the case of some of the uh, newer democracies in East Central Europe, uh, the Southern European case is kind of a really optimistic one because it, the the, the uh, Southern European countries are, um, to a large extent, um, free of right-wing uh, illiberal parties. Not entirely, uh, but certainly Spain and Portugal um, don't have any uh, right-wing populist party unless you consider the mainstream conservative parties as being right-wing populist, and some people would make that argument. Um, but also, even in Greece, where we have Golden Dawn, it is not the main story of party system change over the last 10 years, which is, of course, uh, Syriza, the, the left party. So, um, I have a few slides with some numbers. Um, I don't know if you'll find them useful, but first of all, uh, just to give a sense of what, what is actually going on when we look at the political changes over the last decade or so, in, in, in the democracies, and I put, I put volatility data for Europe here largely because it's harder to find for a, for a bigger data set, up to date at least. Um, but what you can see there is that electoral instability, volatility is basically summing the uh, net changes in the vote between one election to the next for all of the political parties. And you get a number which we call volatility, or the Peterson in index, um, as, and as you can see, over the kind of post-war uh, period, uh, in these kind of established democracies, it's kind of stable, slightly increasing until we get to the 2000s, um, uh, when it starts to rise more, uh, uh, more, more clearly, and in particular, 
in the last decade or so after the 2008 financial crisis. And this is one of the themes of my book is that I think a lot of what is going on is to do with um, the financial crisis in the short run, but also uh, the longer term process of liberalization that has affected all of these countries leading up to the financial crisis. So, here's a very untidy uh, <laughs> chart, but uh, there's a reason for presenting this very ugly chart, is that I can then show you how, by carving it up in different ways, we can tell, tell a story which is a bit more coherent. So, these are, uh, just in case you're wondering, uh, part of the purpose of the slide as well is to show what parties I'm talking about. So, you can see there, if your eyesight is better than mine, you'd be able to see some of the parties I described as anti-system. And they're a mix of kind of uh, left anti-capitalist parties and right-wing populist parties. Uh, and as you can see, actually, um, these parties have been around for a while. Uh, it, it's not a, a total novelty. Uh, we have, in particular, looking through and uh, trying to compile this data set, I was surprised by the extent to which many of the countries that we would consider to be extremely consolidated and stable liberal democracies with wonderful uh, values embedded in their institutions have been the first to have major pushes from right-wing and liberal parties. So I'm talking about countries like Norway, uh, Denmark, um, and uh, um, to some extent um, also the Netherlands have all seen sort of surges of these right-wing parties receiving really high vote shares. Actually, the, I didn't mention the most obvious one, which is Austria, which had, in the late 1990s, uh, the Freedom Party getting uh, about 28% of the vote, which is quite a spectacular vote share for an anti-system party. But if we sort of cut it down, so this is not a complete novelty. It's been going on for a while. There are large, and you could argue with how I categorize anti-system, and we could have a debate about that if you're interested. But whichever way you, you, you carve it up, these parties have been around for a while, and um, um, the increase in the recent period actually uh, is largely driven by the increase in support for left anti-system parties, and in particular in Southern Europe. So this is what happens uh, for the Southern European section of, uh, of, uh, of that chart. And you can see that kind of parties on the left fringes of the party system have been stably getting you know, between zero, you know, 2 or 3 and 10% of the vote in Southern Europe until the financial crisis, and then all of a sudden it, it explodes. And uh, uh, you have, um, some parties have been around for, for, for a while, so the left Catalan party, for example, has been around for a while. Actually, that graph understates its increase in support, because of course it only stands in Catalonia, and this is a national vote share, so I should probably um, change that, because I would get a nice leap there too. <laughs> uh, but the big shocks are the Five Stars movement in Italy, which I categorize as left, although I'm well aware that actually it's not obviously a left, but it's certainly not obviously a right-wing populist party either. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, big jump in support for Podemos in Spain as well uh, is... Um, is a good example of this. The most spectacular one is Syriza in Greece, uh, which uh, from being a party with about, as you can see there, you know, less than 5% of the vote, it became the governing party and more or less completely uh, supplanted the PASOK, which was the kind of traditional social, socialist, social democratic party in Greece. So, uh, so what I've tried to do is carve up uh, these anti-system parties into a kind of left and right uh, left and right groupings. Actually, by left, I mean left and catch-all, because some of these parties don't have a clear left identity, but what they are not is <coughs> Orban-style illiberal right-wing populist parties. And you can, you can see that the lines kind of follow each other uh, until the financial crisis, and then there's a much sharper increase in the anti-system left. <coughs> The financial crisis, and that makes all kinds of sense if you think about it. That um, you know the impact of the financial crisis was particularly strong in uh, what I call broadly debtor countries, countries that were running uh, current account deficits over the period preceding the financial crisis, and there were, therefore were very uh, dependent on their creditors. Countries like Germany, biggest creditor of them all when it comes to Europe. Uh, and uh, the squeeze placed on people's incomes after the uh, credit crunch uh, 
has clearly caused a lot of pain and anguish and has been exploited in particular by parties on the anti-capitalist left who are appealing a variety of ways for uh, reductions in the amount of austerity that is enforced and, uh, and arguing for a more redistributive kind of, kind of politics. Um, so just to make that uh, point a little bit starker, I divided these uh, anti-parties up into Northern and Southern European and there you can see a very similar kind of pattern, which is that the amount of sort of non-traditional anti-system uh, votes that you can uh, um, quantify for, uh, for European countries is, you know, a fairly similar trend and the number's not too far apart until you get to 2010, 2011, when the anti-system vote share in, in Southern Europe increases uh, spectacularly. Um, reaching an average of just uh, under 40%. So this is party system changing uh, 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 stuff going on here. Um, so, I mean, the rest of the story I've got to tell is about trying to explain why it is that um, the reaction to the crisis and the forms of contestation within um, uh, party politics in different democracies takes different forms. Um, given the content of the discussion so far, I'm not sure this is really what you're most interested in and whether you might be more interested really in the story about what uh, this implies for a liberal democracy and for liberal democracy. Um, so I think, how long do I have left? You can go ahead, I mean... Yeah, I'm not, I will try, so I will try and tell what, you, what is... Uh, okay, so I have a kind of empirical story and a normative underpinning to it. So I mean, the empirical story, quite simply, is that uh, you uh, have different types of crises in countries with different uh, uh, positions on the creditor-debtor divide uh, and different types of welfare states. Mm -hmm. So um, there's nothing too earth-shatteringly new about this. Um, it's a good old two-by-two two table. Comparative <laughs> politics uh, was mentioned earlier as being defined by studying countries that are not your own, and it also involves extensive use of two-by-two two tables <laughs> with typologies. So this is old-style uh, comparative politics. Um, and so what we get is countries which have, um, and these, um, there's a very long story about how these welfare state institutions are linked to creditor debtor status, but uh, we don't have time to go, go into that. So what we see, if we were here in Germany, and Germany is a creditor country with a current account surplus of 8% of GDP, which is driving everybody crazy, um, and it is a coordinated market economy with what used to be a very generous welfare state, these days not quite so much, but we can certainly categorize it as an inclusive uh, welfare state. And many other similar uh, neighboring, usually, countries with similar kinds of institutions are also in that, in that cell. Uh, then you have, you know, my uh, homeland, the Anglo-Saxon world, where we forget about the welfare state. Uh, um, we still, you know, have a welfare state, but it's not a, not a very adequate one. It's certainly not inclusive. Um, and so the big difference between sort of this part of Northern Europe and this, uh, the Anglo-Saxon world, is that this part of Northern Europe has a lot of burden sharing, which equalizes incomes and, and is more protective uh, of, of the population, whereas in the liberal market economies, as they're often called, uh, people are extremely exposed to fluctuations in the, in the market. Uh, big high levels of uh, income insecurity and income inequality. And then we have this other bunch of countries, forget about the residual welfare state with uh, credit to status. I don't know anything about Switzerland, it confuses me, and it's only one case. So. Uh, but this other cell here is this, uh, what we could call broadly the, uh, the Southern European uh, model, which is, uh, these are debtor countries, okay? They do not run current account surpluses, although they're trying to now, but it's extremely hard for them. In the period before the financial crisis, they were deeply exposed to international uh, financial um, uh, dynamics. Uh, but they also have particular kinds of inclusive welfare states. They have inclusive welfare states, which are relatively protective of the population, much more so than in the Anglo-Saxon countries. But they do it in a much more uh, um, divisive way than in the uh, coordinated market economies hit. So what you get is very dualistic forms of welfare and dualistic types of labor market access. So what that means is that some people are relatively protected by the welfare state, 
and labor market regulation and other people are extremely exposed to the crisis. And here is the key to why it is that you're getting uh, different types of anti-system reaction in these different places. So I'm arguing that uh, in the inclusive predator countries, uh, right-wing anti-immigrant parties have been particularly successful because these countries have systems of social protection that uh, work quite well and people want to keep. And they see uh, migration and the need to bail out uh, debtor countries in the Eurozone as being a threat to this uh, set of arrangements that they want to protect. Uh, in the, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon countries, we have both, because everybody is exposed to the crisis. So uh, whether you're, you know, you're uh, trying to protect your, your status or you're angry about your low status, you have something to be angry about, because we're all exposed to, to high levels of income inequality and insecurity. But in the Southern European case, what you get is quite interesting, which is that these countries are very exposed to the crisis, but the dualistic nature of the welfare institutions means that different groups are affected in different ways and that the groups that are most exposed to the crisis are the younger part of the population and even relatively highly educated younger part of the population. So this gives you some insights into what kind of electorate is available to be mobilized by anti-system forces. In these countries, uh, you can have older, less educated, so sort of manual, the white working class, as we now call it in, in, in debates in, in Britain and America anyway, um, relatively uneducated uh, people who feel they've lost status and lost protection from the, from the uh, vagaries of the market, and uh, therefore uh, they are vulnerable to a right-wing populist appeal because it chimes with their values. In the South, those kind of people are very well protected by the welfare state. They enjoy job tenure, they enjoy good pensions, and the costs of all these things are thrown onto the young, who have no labor market access and no chance of getting a pension. Um, and these people are less likely to respond to a right-wing uh, anti-immigrant appeal, because the younger people are often quite highly educated. And as a result, they're much more likely to respond uh, with it to an anti-capitalist appeal. Uh, by the way, this also applies to some extent in the UK and the US. I know I wasn't supposed to talk about the UK and the US, but uh, in the UK and the US, both of these kinds of people are exposed to the crisis. And in Britain, you get the wonderful irony that the local elections next week are going to deliver the best performance uh, of the Labour Party in London uh, in the whole of history, probably, according to polls, when it's had its most left-wing leader and when London is most... Uh, uh, is, is, is at its richest compared to the rest of the country that it has ever been. So that makes no sense until you start to understand that a lot of highly educated people in dynamic growing parts of the economy also feel very exposed to these changes. Okay, uh, so I'll just make one final wrapping up point, which is that if, uh, as I try and argue in the book, that the, that a liberal democracy is a response to the failings of liberal democracy, and in particular it's uh, its decision to pri give primacy to liberalism and especially economic liberalism over democracy, uh, we don't need to necessarily be too pessimistic because there are other forces moving uh, in Western democracies and actually, especially in Southern Europe, but not only, even in Northern Europe too, there are these parties, uh, which are trying to push against uh, what we could call, call a kind of hyper-liberal or neoliberal democracy uh, but not with illiberal values, but instead with an appeal to return to some of the values of inclusiveness, equality, and welfare protection that liberal democracies actually had back in the 50s and 60s and 70s without perhaps some of these other liberal values that we now give primacy to, but which certainly did give greater emphasis to uh, equality and social cohesion. And that's me. I will also switch a little bit the perspective because, uh, well, both of you present more those anti-system and uh, illiberal uh, party situation in, in, in uh, Europe. I will go a step back and try to explain why this has happened in the first place. And I will also change a little bit the geographic perspective because I will bring in the United States and thereby the orange elephant uh, bringing him into the room. Um, what I'm, I'm, the argument that I'm presenting is based on the book that uh, Boris and me have been written uh, and published a couple of months ago, 
Um, and Boris already said something about our core argument on a more conceptual level, so I try to put some empirical meat on these theoretical bones. So what we try to do in a nutshell in our book is to think about some form of causal story that leads to phenomena like Brexit in the UK, the election of Trump in the US, and successes from those anti-system right-wing and left-wing populist party in nearly every part of European countries. Uh, if you look into the specific national debates that we have done right now here, um, on those problems, you find a lot of particular explanations in order to explain the success of populist movements and actors. And we do not doubt those different explanations are important, but what we tried is to integrate them into our study as well. So factors like race and racism in the United States, ideological polarization in the US, we didn't touch this problem so far, I guess that's also important, we see signs of a growing polarization in European countries as well. Uh, the refugee crisis in Europe and especially in Germany, um, and also the transformation of the public sphere. We touched this problem as well. But those particular explanations, and this was on the, on our starting point in writing the book, cannot explain why all those trends and developments have happened nearly at the same time in the last five, six years, although you make clear that those anti-system parties have then been for a longer time, but I guess since the financial crisis 2008, there is a clear rise in all of those countries. So we were trying to find factors that explain, in a broader perspective, looking at North America and Europe, um, those uh, right-wing and anti-system parties. Um, so let me quickly articulate the central argument that we made in our book. Uh, unfortunately, the book is just out in, in German, so we hope to find a publisher that will translate it into English um, so that we have a broader audience. Uh, but if, if you are able to read German, you should buy the book for sure. <laughs> because we have, we have a final a chapter um, where we say how we come out of this crisis. We will not talk about this because you should buy the book. <laughs> um, so our argument is that populism and illiberal tendencies in, in, in the North Atlantic region are not the cause of the crisis of government, but its result. The crisis has been many decades in the making and is linked to the rise of certain type of political philosophy and practices that had is extended across both sides of the Atlantic. This dominant political ideology or dogma has been marketization um, as the only possible and legitimate way of organizing societies in the context of globalization. The shift from responsive governmental institution to process processual and se semi-private government bodies has contributed to the depolitization of all things political. Populism in Europe and the United States is an expression of this imminent crisis of liberalism uh, in which economic rationalities have hollowed out political values and have led to an impoverishment of the political sphere. In my presentation, I will, because we have talked a lot about Europe, um, I will mainly focus on the United States. Um, because I think what we see in the United States is a radical way of this argument that we see um, and we can also talk about why maybe it's not that intense in European countries. So what are the common factors that we see in the United States, but I guess in a lot of European countries as well? Declining popular participation in election and politics. Weaknesses in the functioning of government. I guess that's what uh, um, yesterday was uh, framed as state capacities and decline in state capacities. Declining trust in institutions dwindling appeal of mainstream representative parties, widening gap between political elites and electorates, and declining popular participation in elections, and, and oh, I mentioned this at the beginning. So what has happened? And I think a look at opinion polls is very helpful here. Um, and what we see in all European countries and, and in the United States really in an extreme way is a decline in trust. Um, and this is especially problematic for a representative democracy. Um, as a result of this massive decline in trust in government in the United States, it has, has declined since the 1960s from 68% at that time to about 
just before the Trump election took place. And if you look at, at specific institutions in the United States, it's even worth um, Congress, for example, approval ratings were below 10%. At one time, it was even below North Korea. Um, so there you can see how unpopular specific institutions in the United States have been. Um, and as a result, the Economist Intelligent Unit in 2017 downgraded the U.S. into the status of a flawed democracy because of this decline in trust and this mechanism, this representational mechanism that is, seems not to function anymore. Uh, and if you look at the survey that The Economist did, but as well if you look in different um, uh, surveys, you find three points that are mentioned more often that try to explain this decline in trust. The first is growing inequality. The second is declining social mobility. And the third one is the influence of money and corporatist interest in politics. That's the three factors that are mentioned most often in all those even by people. That's the list that they make uh, what they are not satisfied with. Um, and those factors can easily be, su be supported by empirical evidence. We talked about Piketty. Um, he really gave us uh, the empirical data to see what has happened uh, with inequality, especially in the United States. Um, and the interesting part is you mentioned that he has this um, the rate of return of capital investment is higher than, than GDP. Um, it's interesting because I would criticize him in this way. This seems to be some kind of natural law, as if there is a market that produces this outcome. Because if you look at inequality, it was higher, <coughs> very high at the beginning of the 20th century. Then it went down massively, or Krugman called it the Great Compression. And then starting in the 80s, it was, went up again uh, to, to degrees that we have seen in those glory 20s. Uh, and I guess there you can see, and this argument is also in his book, but not that uh, strong, it's about how the state uh, regulates the market, how uh, the taxation of capital and labor income is divided. And what we have seen in recent years since the 1970s is that uh, tax rates on capital went down, whereas tax rates on labor went up. So it's clear that we see these kind of developments that he described with his argument. But there is another dimension, and there I want to bring in another author um, that I think is very important, and this is Martin Gielens, because he showed clearly for the United States that this, in his book, Affluence and Influence, that this inequality in income translates into an in inequality in political influence. That means what he did in, on an empirical basis, and that's the interesting part, he looked at what kind of interests, or let, let, let me frame it in a different way. He looked at the interests of the lower income groups, the interests of the middle income groups, so-called middle class, and the top 1%. And this argument has been in a perfect democracy, there's a linear correlation between it. That means the more people want change, the higher the, 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 the probability of chance, uh, change is. And what he finds is that this fits perfect to the 1%. If they want change, they get policy change. But this connection doesn't work anymore for the middle class and the lower income groups. If they want change, the government is not reacting anymore. And that's a problem for a democratic system that I try to explain with this. The formal institutions, the electoral connections is still there, but the interests, those who are hurt in the political process, are just the 1% and the huge corporations. And we argue in our book that those three factors that we can see, growing inequality, declining social mobility, and influence of money in politics, is in part result of the what we called neoliberal TINA policy uh, since the 1980s. TINA meaning there is no alternative. Um, and this is a policy that you find on the left and on the right. Uh, I mean, you, you have seen this in the 90s where the social democratic parties in the United States, in Great Britain and in Germany have moved massively to the right. Third way politics, that's the, this was the term. Clinton, Blair, Schröder. So what is at the core um, of these policies? It's the downsizing uh, of the welfare regimes, 
and massive deregulation of markets. Um, and those have been explained by all party parties as some kind of um, natural consequence of the processes of globalization. There is no alternative for doing this policy. We are now on a, in a competitive market as states and we have to compete for investments and in doing so we have to lower the cost, downsizing the welfare regime and making our country more attractive for investment. That means lowering regulations as well. As a con consequence of those policies and what they led to, um, more and more people don't feel represent represented anymore. Alternatives, personal as well as programmatic ones, are missing. So people opted for the Brexit because the established parties have not been in favor of the Brexit. Um, they voted for Trump, Trump and Sanders because they did not want to have another Clinton in the White House. They saw already one Clinton in the 1990s and he ended welfare as the Americans uh, knew it. They also voted for Macron in France because he did not belong to one of the established parties. So our argument is a little bit that it's not a vote for populists, it's a vote against established political elites and political parties. So why is the United States, or why are the United States an extreme case? Well, because I guess they originally have a weak welfare regime. Um, and this provides no kind of silencer to TINA policies. So those, what we have seen in the financial crisis, hit the United States very hard. People lost houses, people lost their retirement savings, um, education is not affordable anymore for many people, so there is no perspective. This is different in a lot of European countries, uh, especially Germany and, and the Scandinavian countries that still have better welfare regimes that might silence these neoliberal policies a little bit and thereby weakening this frustration and anti-system anti um, politics. So our argument was, and this is a little bit what we think where we can overcome this crisis, um, as long as the established political parties don't provide and discuss and fight for political alternatives, we will su see successful mobilization on the right and on the left. And I guess that's what we see also in Germany right now with the discussion of the coalition between the two large parties. There is no difference anymore. And the major opposition party now is the AfD. So people recognize the establishment and right-wing populists as the opposition. And this was, I guess, the argument that the SPD made shortly after the election. No, we want to go back into the opposition to show that there is another alternative to radical policy. But it doesn't work, and I'm not quite sure if the SPD will be successful in reforming the party being at the same time in government. This is the problem. So <coughs> we make another argument beside this policy alternative argument. We also make some kind of argument that we need, and this might be utopian ideas, but how to rearrange uh, policy especially um, that is disconnected from the nation, nation state as organizing principle. So we have to think about, and we talked about this uh, yesterday a little bit, we have to think that specific problems cannot be solved anymore on the national level. So we need to look, if you look at climate policy, environment policy, uh, security policy with regard to terrorism, you need some kind of regimes that are organized on a different level, maybe global, maybe more regional, <coughs> Europe and, and other areas or the North Atlantic region. There might be other policy fields, I guess you mentioned infrastructure, that might even be organized by sub-national levels. So we're opting in a little bit of in, in favor of a federal system, a global federal system, but not with strong levels. So there might be an overlap in specific policy areas, and I guess that's the way of thinking we need um, in order to find solution on the, on the, for the problems that we see with regard to globalization, uh, with regard to uh, inequality, with regard to uh, climate policy. And as long as the established political elites don't do these kind of debates, 
um, populace will be successful in mobilizing. And if you look, and that's the interesting part, if you look at the United States, what is happening right now is that even if there is a populist in the White House, the policy goes on. So inequality is growing. There is corporate interest influence of money in politics. What does this mean for the next election or the election coming after the next election? Will there, will there be an even more radical candidate uh, that might be successful as one candidate that really has a program? Because I guess that's the, the only positive thing we can say about Trump. He has no program. <laughs> this is why maybe the system of checks and balances still work in, in, in keeping him a little bit uh, uh, in, in, in the normal field of politics. But what will happen if there's really someone who, who has the idea to transform uh, the United States into some other maybe fascist state? Um, I guess people getting more and more frustrated will maybe opt uh, voting for such a candidate. And that's the main problem that we see in, in our book. Okay, thank you very much. We have half an hour, and I think it would make sense, rather than for us to keep on discussing among ourselves, to open the floor directly and also to have more time um, and take direct questions. Uh, and uh, also in the sake, uh, for the sake of the broader discussion we're having, uh, to have everybody on board as fast as possible. So um, let's take uh, three questions. Uh, Christian Landfried, and then we take the two of you. Yeah, Matthias. And uh, Catherine, let's take four. Okay, that's not too many. So uh, I wanted uh, just to a question for the last talk uh, of uh, Christian Lamont. Uh, well, I couldn't listen more. I you have said. So we have many overlaps between yeah, our sure. statements. Yeah. And um, we're both political scientists. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> 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 no, but I, I really of course, uh, I think, uh, well, we are here interdisciplinary, but yeah. it's also good to see that you know, from, uh, from one field, I think uh, that this is really also the right questions you ask. Uh, independent from the discipline now. Uh, but my question would be to your last overcoming. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I would also agree with going beyond the nation state. The problem I see, and this is my question, at a moment where these populists are successful because of the reasons you have shown. Uh, and these populists being against governments beyond the nation state mm -hmm. and against open borders, I think this is what we see now Macron has this problem in Europe because not so many people are pushing him. So how could we manage, I think we need utopian ideas at the moment. I think if, if it's the time for that, we cannot just have policy proposals. So I agree also even, also Piketty, he, he makes proposals which we think this is uh, crazy, but I think you have to think in these no. terms. But what would you say at the moment to go beyond the nation state, what would you propose against <laughs> these many people who are at the moment against? Mm -hmm. It's like repairing a ship on the sea, you know? it's. Uh, there would be, have been better moments to go there 20 years ago, where we had all these ideas of beyond the nation state. At the moment, it's especially difficult. So what would be your answer? I was going to Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, can, I, I can think about an answer. <laughs> um, this is also to Professor Lambert. Um, I thought it was interesting when you talked about a vote against the establishment, especially in the US election last year. Um, but I also think it's interesting, and this hasn't really been talked about at all, either yesterday or today, about Bernie Sanders' campaign. Mm -hmm. And um, as a student who like supported Bernie, and a ma majority of the people that I know did support Bernie, um, I think I would, in fact, characterize his campaign as having very populist elements mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. um, but so far, populism has been defined in this talk as something that seemingly is either racist or anti-immigrant. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be interesting to hear more about thoughts about how the anti-establishment has been a very key part of how students in America react, considering how most of us are going to graduate with tons of debt. Um, 
well, like the top 1% is not going to have to deal with that problem. Um, even in Bard College, like a lot of students are going to graduate with debt. Um, and how that, that reacts in a, a global standpoint, but also in a more national standpoint. I'd just like mm -hmm. to hear your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I have a question concerning Elena's presentation, but but uh, also it's, it's it's an open question to to uh, to anyone uh, concerning the 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 actions or or the inaction of the of the European uh, Union. I come from Hungary, uh, so <laughs> 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 being being here is also a patriotic duty for me. And, uh, I come from Macedonia, I empathize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I come from Hungary, and, and where I come from, uh, leftist critiques of the European Union often make the point that uh, that real action will not be taken until, until economic interests of, of, uh, uh, of Western European states are, uh, are in in uh, danger, we 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 see uh, that uh, European uh, Western European corporations are able to use Hungary as as an asset market, and they gain a lot of profit. Mm -hmm. We can we can see uh, them uh, using the cheap labor force of Eastern European countries. We see uh, governments. I I don't know about other governments. I know that the Hungarian government often uh, enters into so-called strategic cooperations with with uh, with uh, corporations, which means uh, tax reliefs for these for these companies. And we have seen. Uh, how how direct action was taken against Greece when when there was not a not a political but an economic uh, dispute. So I, I would like to hear your thoughts about about this point. Um, I just wanted to ask why we would consider the populist trends as a as a new establishment. Uh, you know, in some ways, of course, going back to an old establishment, as, uh, 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 as John Hopkins pointed out, um, because it seems to be the case that what we're looking at is a, um, a further pushing forward of neoliberal economic reforms, so called, uh, with the sort of discursive cover of the anti immigration, racism, and so on. Um, we shouldn't forget that it's, it's becoming clear that in the Brexit, for example, there's the effect of international financial interests in, in, in shaping that vote, as well as the votes of people from regions that have been uh, left behind economically. And the current uh, Conservative government is, is, uh, is kept in power by what I hope we would call, consistent with your terminology, an ethno-regional uh, right-wing anti-austerity party, right? You have the double face there of sort of highly neoliberal economics with uh, a populist regionalism. And I just wonder why we are not considering that a new establishment, a new political elite, because it's actually continuing the neoliberalism of the 1990s in actual fact. Although discursively, it's, um, it looks like something different, and it's obviously doing that for strategic reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take them in the order of appearance. Oh, okay. I'm starting with the most uh, difficult uh, uh, question: how, how to overcome this in a situation where we see this racism and xenophobic and this reorientation on the nation state. Um, I mean, it, this is something that cannot happen from today to tomorrow. So there is no switch that we can do, and then everything will be fine again. That's clear. That's clear. Uh, it, it will be a, a fight that has to be uh, uh, fought in in the public sphere and. Right now, this is, and this is what I would criticize in, in the first place, what is missing right now. What we see in, in the German uh, debate right now, what the uh, Bavarian uh, uh, Christian party is doing is trying to be more populist than, than the populists uh, and trying to fight populism in a way to take over their arguments. That's not the right way to do it. I mean, you have to fight those ideas. That's what democracy is about. 
Um, and we have to go into the discussions uh, with those right-wing populists. I mean, there are books out right now, how to talk to populists. Uh, I guess it's not that difficult to talk to them because we have other ideas and we can present those ideas and we can refute what they argue. Um, and the second thing that makes me more optimistic that this is possible, that I think it's still a minority opinion uh, that those people represent. Even if you look at Trump, okay, he has won uh, the presidential election. First of all, I would make the argument he's not a populist. He is, I don't know what he is. He is he. Is he. That's, that, I guess that's his whole program. Um, but he, but because of being nothing, uh, populist forces were able to get into the, the White House with their ideas. But if you look who, who voted for Trump uh, in the general election, I guess it, it's 28%. The rest voted for Hillary or didn't show up at the polls. Even in the primaries uh, in the Republican Party, just 9% of those who could participate in the primaries voted for Donald Trump. Now, I would make the argument that's a minority. And in the United States, it's because of the specifics of the political system, the electoral college and so on, and also because of Hillary Clinton that he was able to, um, uh, to win this election. So I think what we see in, in the United States right now with this massive mobilization, the women's march, the student protests, although they are just focused on gun violence, I guess it's a broader movement that we see there. So civil society reacts to those forces. And this is something that we need to see here in Europe as well. And I guess then um, we will see that this is just a minority position. That's, that's my hope. So we have to fight it and we have to realize that those populists are not in a majority. Um, the second question, Sanders is a wonderful example um, that supports our thesis that uh, the election results in, in the United States was anti-establishment. I mean, that was interesting if you take both candidates. I mean, Trump is the perfect establishment, but he was able to present himself as an outsider. Even Bernie Sanders is, belongs to the establishment. He was in the Senate for how many years? But he was, I mean, he's caucusing with the Democrats. He, he describes himself as an independent and he ran a campaign as an independent uh, in, in the primary in the United States. And this is why he was success, so successful. Uh, and there are some studies that make the argument that he would have been successful in, in winning against Trump. So there seems to be more of a left-wing populist appeal in the United States than a right-wing populist. Uh, and, and this is, a, if you look into the history of the United States, I mean, there is nearly no tradition of right-wing populism. Uh, when we see uh, populism in the, in the United States, it, it's pro it has been progressive. Hmm. So what we see right now is, is a strange phenomenon. Uh, and I guess it just can be explained with this uh, being dissatisfied with the political elites. And, and this was something, I mean, we discussed this uh, writing the book, but also with our students. If you imagine, because people were always asking after Trump was elected, how can someone vote for Trump? And then I am always make the argument, just imagine you lost your house in the financial crisis. You lost your retirement savings in the financial crisis. You know that you never can afford a good education for your children because it's so expensive. And then you see that the banks are being bailed out, Wall Street is doing fine and inequality is going up. And even under the Obama administration, there was, I mean, I think that the election of Obama was in, in the same kind of election. He was successful because he made the same kind of arguments. Change we can believe in. Yes, we can. And he didn't deliver for most of the people. So they are frustrated. They see Clintons coming into the White House, they see Bushes coming into the White House, and nothing changes their economic situation. So let's try with Trump. And now they will be disappointed as well. Um, so I guess there is, there, you can find reasons. I mean, you, you record this. Um, I will not say that there are good reasons to vote for Trump. Uh, that's not my point. Uh, but I can understand that they don't want to vote for Hillary Clinton. And there was no alternative. This is also a problem, I guess, of the United States, that you have just a two-party system. You have always these horse races. In, the United, uh, in, in Germany, in a multi-party multi system, like Germany, like, like France, there is a chance to get this protest into the political system as a minority party. And this is what we have seen in Germany over the last 20 years. Most of those parties disappeared after one term in office in, in parliament because everyone realizes they have no idea 
they, there is no alternative that they represent, so they will be voted out of office next election. I'm not quite sure if this will happen with the AfD. If you look at public opinion polls right now, they are going up, not down. But I guess that's also because of the coalition policy um, and, and problems of the established political parties don't providing alternatives. So now I stop and leave. I mean, one of the things that's looming also here is that there's not just, there doesn't just seem to be a geographical variety of uh, crises or illiberal democracies, but the crisis itself might be metamorphosing over time. And so I wonder if we have to think about this temporal register also when we're when we're trying to categorize. Mm -hmm. Elena. Um, good question, thank you. Um, yes, so I focus only on the EU institutions and basically answering the question of why doesn't the EU do something, one, because it can't, and B, because it's not necessarily within its, the interest of the different components of the EU. Um, I agree absolutely with what you said, and that is the case uh, with corporations and businesses generally having an interest not uh, not just um, in terms of lower costs, but also in terms of being able to deal with the government, knowing uh, knowing who, whom to turn to, and that is one group. So it's not dealing with different actors, but rather dealing with one particular actor. Uh, this is something that is, it's not just in Hungary, as you said, so it's in quite a few member states um, and in the candidate countries. So this whole periphery, uh, when I refer to the periphery, I didn't necessarily talk about the periphery of the EU, the periphery within the EU as well. Um, and um, I agree with you that, I mean, I don't know whether that, is, that was what, what you were arguing, but it is definitely true that uh, a stable this whole idea of a stable government, it is within the, the, the corporation's interest, which, you know, democracy is not necessarily, it's a bit messy. Sure, it's pluralistic, but it is a bit messy. Um, so I'm not sure that the influence is necessarily done through the EU, uh, but there is, it, 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 they definitely do sub provide the support for, for this kind of um, <coughs> systems to continue. Among other things, by actually providing uh, employment for quite a few people who actually vote for those, uh, for those parties. Um, so I'm not sure whether that is something that is EU related. I think it's something that is, um, broadly speaking, the economic system in Europe um, related. How the EU is uh, how the, e the European system of periphery and core functions. Um, so again, um, I don't think it's within the interest of quite a few uh, uh, governments, but it's also not something that necessarily the EU can address. Jonathan, you want to respond? To yeah, there's a couple of things. First, the point about um, your question was kind of, is populism so bad? And, and it depends on how you define populism. And I'm not really that happy with the Jan Vernemuller kind of approach. I mean, I think that's an interesting phenomenon he captures and he defines very well, but I don't think that's what's... I mean, there's obviously an anti-elite, anti-establishment dimension to a lot of these movements, but they, there's something they have in common. They're all pretty much asking to curb capitalism in one way or another, even if it's just putting up borders to stop so many migrants coming through, right? Even that is a form of protecting society from things which, you know, partly it's to do with refugee crisis, all about war, obviously, but most migration is economically driven. So these are market dynamics. Mm. And when you're talking about the consequences of the financial crisis, people ending up with terrible debts, losing their savings, and so on and so on, this is, you know, straight out of the 20s and 30s, right? It's, it's financial markets destroying people's livelihoods, and they're appealing for somebody to take control. So this phrase, this marvelous phrase of the Brexit campaign, take back control, I mean, I hate the people who are saying this, but, uh, the, but yes, I think we should take back control, not in the way they want, and not from the things that they're worried about necessarily. <laughs> But, but people feel nobody's in charge, right? They feel that the, there's a whole load of things going on in the world that they have no control over. Um, so I think that kind of populism, demanding that the government actually works on behalf of the people, which is, you know, if we think about William Riker's distinction between liberal and populist democracy, you could see liberal democracy as being about guaranteeing some basic individual rights, especially property rights, and then leaving people to be free to work their way through life in whatever way they can compared to populist democracy being about government securing things that are in the interests of the people. And that's the kind of populism that I think there's a huge demand for. 
And I think we were running a risk if we dismiss populism as being Nigel Farage and Orban or whoever else, and, and failing to recognize that there are very legitimate claims that people are making on governments to do things for them. Yeah, I, I would agree with this critique of populism because it, it's often used to um, undermine other types of critiques of liberal democracy that are non, non-extremist. But uh, to pick up uh, Catherine's questions, which I find very important as well. So is, if I understood it correctly, is populism the new normal? Mm. Um, and I think that also plays, uh, picks up this notion of the tem- temporal dimension. In part, I would agree it's a discursive question, it's a rhetorical question, because if you look at Trump, or at the US context at least, uh, yes, there has been a hyper-liberalization, hyper-privatization when it comes to domestic issues uh, in the environmental sector, in finance, um, in education, at least there have been attempts. Um, Towards the international realm, I think it's not just a question of discursive... Uh, this wasn't what I was asking. Yeah. I mean, my question is whether instead we should understand this phenomenon as, uh, you know, people keep talking about the political elites and so on, as a sort of takeover by the economic elites of the state, right? And then the use of these discursive sort of slanders against various parts of the population to make it seem as if they're also catering towards the working class constituency or Absolutely. Only working class constituency yeah. and we have some double movement going on. Yeah. Uh, so I mean I, I appreciate these comments about you know uh, talking to populists and, and we should hold the social democratic parties responsible or, or even the conservative yeah. parties responsible for their complicity with these rhetorics and so on. But I'm wondering whether in fact uh, you know I mean Elena was pointing some of this out in her talk there's a, an organized complicity between the estab- some of the established parties in Europe and some of these more extreme figures uh, you know, in, in right-wing movements across Europe. And we might need to think about the reasons why that's structurally occurring and why it structurally was possible for somebody like Trump, who, I mean, regardless of anything he actually says, is a, pure, a p- figure of purely economic significance, right? He's moved into the political arena uh, and he is you know, relentlessly pursuing the economic interests of people at his level of, uh, of wealth, right? And that this, um, you know, I mean, it's a very complicated issue how this is actually happening, but the reason I'm mentioning the example of Britain is because there we, we, we don't even yet have the full picture of how that exactly happened in the case of Brexit. We have, we're hearing things about the influence of Saudi Arabia, about you know, financial uh, sorts of uh, you know, um, attempts to, to, in, to, to shape the way the vote operated through technology and through newspaper ads in the right places at the right time and so on. And this very concerted effort to push things in the direction of further abolition of any sort of regulation of labor rights markets that the EU provides, right? Um, And you have a government in Britain that uh, has people in it who who favor that kind of economics, uh, but they're also, you know, interestingly at the moment supported by an extreme right-wing anti-austerity party. They're keeping themselves in power through the support of a group like that. And I think it sort of sums up, in a way, the double movement we're seeing. On the one hand, very wealthy people, very powerful international economic interests wanting to get rid of what some of us would regard as the fairly minimal sorts of protections that an entity like the EU offers. And then on the other hand, uh, you know, sort of people at the lower income level who've been, who've been disadvantaged in various ways have been pointed out, and they're being appealed to on the very traditional, uh, with very traditional strategy of scapegoating. It's the fault of the immigrants, it's the fault of whoever. Uh, so, so it's a kind of two pronged sort of tendency we're seeing, and it just seems that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this is. This is the way the new establishment is operating. Even but where it doesn't, even where the main political party doesn't explicitly present itself as populist, it, there's often some kind of investment in or complicity with this 
with this structure. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry that went on too long, but we're basically, by, by basically challenging this idea that somehow there's a political elite in the establishment that has failed and has, you know, uh, needs to kind of get get itself organized again and get itself mm -hmm. invested again in, in real people's concerns because we're dealing with such a structurally powerful phenomenon that that seems like it seems to me like a very moralistic sort of uh, kind of um, you know an ethical argument that obviously makes sense but it just can't possibly be adequate to face what's happening. Well, I, I, then I wouldn't call it new establishment because that's been, I mean, that's been ongoing for four or five decades that there has been a strong interrelationship between economic and, and, and political interests. Uh, you could even speak of state capture when, when Elena was speaking and talking about uh, low trust in institutions, client, uh, clientelism, uh, promises for economic growth, the trickle down. I mean, uh, all these uh, legitimate legitimation discourses have been around in the West as well, as well maybe not quite as long as, as in these uh, contexts, and maybe this crisis is breaking out at a, at a new point. Uh, still, I don't think it's just about uh, moral. I think um, Christian mentioned the Great Compression. It's also about ho holding people accountable and uh, f asking for new type, of, for more inclusive uh, ways of organizing the political system in order to, um, well, Recontrol or re-embed the market, um, and since you mentioned double movement, yes, I think many of us also yesterday have made a, cult, a, Pol a Polanyan, a, a very Polanyan argument. I found found it a very interesting analysis. I'm not quite sure if I'm answering the question now, but there are a couple of other questions, and maybe we'll take them. Or is there another response? I mean, may maybe uh, one response. I mean, if, if you define it in this radical way that it doesn't matter who it gets into office, because it's it's, it's yeah. <laughs> So somehow I understood it that way. No, no. Because what we have seen, and this would be my, then it's maybe a, not the right counter argument. Um, but what we have seen, I said that we had this third, third wave politics that ruined all social democratic parties in Europe. I mean, if we look at the social democrats in Germany, 16%, the French social, uh, social democratic party is nearly non existent anymore because they move to the right. The only social democratic party that is successful right now again and maybe competitive again in election is Labour Party. And they move clearly to the left again. So they... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, y you can see, you can mobilize people if you present an alternative. If this is really, or this w will really be an alternative if they get into government again, I'm not sure. But at least you can appeal for votes, yeah. Ira, then Florian, and then... I'm broadly sympathetic to what was just said, but um, some confounding <laughs> facts. Um, first, uh, after the 2007-8 crash would have been seen in 2005 and 6 as, of course, a terrible thing if it would have happened, but a social democrat's dream. Um, capitalism is <laughs> globally. Um, uh, we have been saying for years how vulnerable it is. First question, why in the aftermath of 2008, and it can't just be because they were also ne neoliberals, I don't accept that because they were still very differently defined in rhetoric and in some policies from uh, uh, the center right. Uh, certainly, uh, maybe less so in Germany, even in Britain. Um, if you look at the record of the Blair government, say on health or, uh, uh, and social protections as compared to the Cameron, and May governments, there's no question of, of significant differences. Um, uh, and yet, the, the people did not rally to social democracy. And as labor moved further to the left in Britain, um, the Miliband campaign was to the left of previous campaigns. It didn't uh, succeed. So Corbyn might under the Brexit condition, but that's a very different reality. So my first question is, is it really always so that um, uh, moving left, as perhaps I would to pr also prefer, um, is a recipe for electoral success. And the record of the last 20 years has shown that the most successful electoral social democrats have not been those who moved to the left, but as in Blair, um, moved in another direction. Blair, after all, won three terms, plus Gordon Brown and uh, so The second um, confounding question for me um, has to do with um, uh, left populism in Europe, and it's large, except for Spain, and 
Portugal, except for the Iberian Peninsula. But in Spain, um, right populism is not present. Um, you have left populism. What accounts for that? Um, why do we have Podemos and the, and the, uh, the housing movements and the mayor of Barcelona and so on? Um, why is the, and it's a democratic left, I would say. It's not an anti-democratic left. Um, why is that form of populism successful there, but we don't see it elsewhere? I don't know, but, uh, but you will. We, we, um, have, we have an answer and, to this yeah, because we dis discussed and, this yesterday. And finally, in the US, <laughs> I think it's not quite right empirically that um, the people most vulnerable voted for Trump. Uh, the people most vulnerable voted for Hillary Clinton, um, and the people really poor in society. Um, second, um, there was an age uh, uh, distribution, and there's an irony, um, because the American, quote, weak welfare state for people over 65 is a very strong welfare state. It has uh, free medical care, it has social security levels, uh, pensions, much higher than Britain, for example. Um, and that was the age group that most voted for Trump. Whereas young people voted under 30, 70, 80, 85 percent for uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, even the Sa Sanders you know, supporters mostly didn't sit it out. So um, we have the irony that the most vulnerable um, actually didn't. Ex it's only because of the electoral college phenomenon that we look at Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, and we can observe that some working class voters who voted for Obama now voted for Trump. Um, uh, but uh, I don't think that adds up to a general explanation uh, of the disaffected. that the average income of a Trump voter was higher than the average income of a Clinton voter. So those are just confounding questions. Mm -hmm. I can be uh, very quick, I think, because I think this is uh, closely connected. I was a little bit alarmed uh, when I heard what I think is actually a little bit of uh, backsliding in what I thought the achievement of the discussion already was. Um, despite the fact that we're trying to, to analyze a situation of which right-wing populism is an important aspect, but that has many other aspects and so on and so forth, that's different from, I think it's just, it's a little bit dangerous unless one is very explicit about it to, um, to uh, equate or, or get close uh, rhetorically to equating uh, movements that are trying, as you put it, to curb capitalism in one way or another um, with uh, populism along the same lines. Um, Sanders, to my mind, is, uh, according to many of the sort of more fine-grained definitions that we've heard, not a populist. Mm -hmm. Of course there are some things that, that he shares, but I think the, the notions of populism that we've already, that we've already sort of worked out here, um, despite their differences, um, make very relevant distinctions there. Um, that was sort of the analytical point, which I think um, is... is uh, is not against uh, substantively any of the arguments that I that I heard, and the empirical point was actually the same that that uh, Ira made, which is uh, the indications about uh, Trump's uh, voting base and uh, the the differences between actual uh, economic uh, vulnerability and uh, you know victimhood of, of globalization, marketization, uh, the the relation to the welfare state. Um, incomes and so on, and voting for Trump, which is, it's not the, the objective losers quite so clearly. I mean, there have been quite a few studies that have um, thrown significant empirical doubt about that. Yeah, I think we can specify this. Um, yeah. um, so I had one question, and I'll be quite brief. I wanted to get the panel's opinion on the a question that, to what extent is, is this sort of wave of populism a result of uh, or a reaction against the sort of democratic deficit that seems to have been caused by a diffusion of power away from the nation state, generally caused by globalization. Great. Can we have short statements? Uh, because we're already in overtime, um, aren't we? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just making sure. Um, so by everyone okay. responding to these questions. Cool. That's a tall order because there's an awful yeah. lot yeah. to do with that. 
Shall I say something about Podemos and then something about Brexit? So about Podemos, the, the point I was trying to make was that uh, the, the pool of uh, the kind of voters, the disgruntled white working class, the, you know, the angry, unemployed uh, uh, manual worker in East Germany, whatever, uh, people like that in Spain have been very well looked after. They had a mass, they had, the sort of specific historical story in Spain is that in the 1980s, Spain had a lot of uncompetitive industries. The socialists closed them all down and gave people whacking early retirement packages that some of these people have been sitting playing cards in the sun for 30 years. And so they have no real reason to be angry. The people who have reason to be angry, angry are those who are under 30 who are facing unemployment rates of 50, 60 percent. If you go to London, you feel like you're in Spain because anyone serving in a bar, if they're not Italian, they're Spanish. I mean, we, we have, you know, there seems to be millions of, uh, of them. And, and these are the people who they're probably not even at home voting for Podemos. There's, <laughs> so, so, so this is the... There are different sets of victims of, of these changes in different countries, and that is driven by institutions, welfare institutions in particular. So that was kind of my story uh, about, about Podemos. It doesn't work perfectly, of course, because Italy in some respects has a similar picture, but they do have a right-wing populist party in the Northern League. But even there, it was originally directed against the Italian state and its corruption and the North-South divide and so on. And, and one thing we did talk about the other night um, with, with, uh, with Boris and Christian was this idea that what seems to be characteristic of the Southern Europeans is that they, it's hard to have a nationalist chauvinist movement when you don't believe in your own state. <laughs> so they have much higher levels of trust in European institutions than in their own national states. And, and I think this is, this is an important dimension. It really weakens the case for a kind of IFD type party. You know, in Greece, the Golden Dawn are literally a Nazi party. They get 6 7%. Syriza, of course, takes over the state and increasingly, immediately starts increasing public employment and, and getting jobs for people. So this is the way, the way it's gone. Just very briefly on Brexit, I think Catherine's points were, were really important of that. I think there is something going on whereby there is this kind of dynamic in the pro-capitalist elite not all pro-capitalists are liberals, right? I mean, a lot of them are reactionary racists. I mean, we see examples of this uh, from Trump's set of advisors, right? Um, so even people in the tech sector, you know, it doesn't mean that they're liberals. So, so what they certainly do want is to hang on to a, a system, an economic system that makes people like that them richer and richer at everybody else's expense. And if the way of doing that is pushing globalization, fine. If the thing turns and suddenly you realize that a large part of the population really hate this stuff, then why not go with, you know, national chauvinism? That, that plays well politically. So Brexit was not a mass movement. It was a movement driven by, by money. We don't really know exactly where, where it came from, but a lot of it from kind of very speculative finance capital, uh, you know, revolving around the city of London. So, so I think, you know, somebody should go and do that history because I think it's really important. So maybe I can uh, try to answer two of the, the, the other broader question. Uh, the Trump voter, for sure, there is. There, you, you cannot just explain voting for Trump with income, um, but there is a lot of studies that show that income mattered. Um, but it's also about the fear of losing its social status. So even if you are in the middle class and you think that there's a policy done that will harm me in the future, um, this was also one of the motivations for uh, voting for Trump. So this is also an economic argument, even if you don't. If you have income that belongs to the middle class, but you expect to have less in 10 years, you, you're in fear of losing what you have already gained, this is problematic for you. Um, older people voting for Trump, I mean, for sure they have social security, but there are also a lot of private investment uh, accumulated during their time, and they lost this um, it, during the financial crisis, what they saved privately. Um, and this is also one of the problems uh, that frustrated them and maybe made maybe a motive uh, for voting for Trump. You have that also racism. For sure, this is also a factor. I, I, I don't want to say that racism is not a factor for specific groups in voting for Trump. It was also a reaction to the Obama administration. Um, it was also a reaction in part that the other candidate was a woman. woman. Um, this, this was some kind of so chauvinistic element in voting for Trump. So it's, it's, you, you never can, can have some monocausal explanation of why the people voted for Trump. But I guess this economic argument, um, uh, at least from our perspective, still makes sense. And the most vulnerable people don't show up at the polls anymore. This is I mean, the bottom income um, segment uh, is, is not voting anymore.
Um, this is what all studies show, that the higher the income, the, the higher the participation rate in elections and in other forms of political participation, this is also a problem. Um, the, the second question was, uh, going to the left means voting election, uh, winning, winning elections. Um, what I said with uh, going to the left is more that we need in a democratic system alternatives. That, that, that was the main motive for making the argument social democrats should move to the, to the left again, to distinguish themselves from uh, being just one of the mainstream parties that fight in the middle um, for a voter group that maybe was large 20 years ago. But with the polarization of the voting group, I guess it might make sense maybe to move more in, in the direction of right and left in order to mobilize. So there is not the automatic relationship moving to the left means winning election. But maybe there is a chance to get more because of polarization, uh, more voters. And the point is to, to, to present an alternative. The American Political Science Association, I guess, in the, in the 1950s published uh, a task force making the argument we have no democracy in the United States because it doesn't matter if there is a Democrat on, on the ballot or a Republican, there is no difference according to programs and whatever. Nowadays, the same APSA makes the argument we are so polarized, it's not a democracy anymore. <laughs> so it seems to be somewhere in between that we need enough alternative, but it's got enough two broad alternatives. Um, yeah, i leave it there. So I'll answer the question about um, the democratic deficit. Um, whether populism is a response to the democratic deficit of uh, some of the international institutions. I don't think it's so much a response to the democratic deficit as it is a response to the crisis of representative democracy, which was mentioned um, already by the panel. But also it's a response to um, largely to what I, what I suggested that in some parts of, of Europe, has been present for a, a long time, and now we see it in the West as well, um, the low trust in institutions. That in and of itself is not a democratic deficit. It's just the lack of trust in institutions. Be, it, be those international or national, it doesn't necessarily matter. So populism, in, I think, both on both sides of the spectrum, um, do come, uh, does come in a form of a response to a particular type of crisis as far as the uh, political system is concerned, which is the crisis of representative democracy. Okay, thank you so much. I think that uh, the question that Florian raised also will be something we will have to grapple with uh, when we talk about uh, the edited volume at some point, or you know, uh, uh, and also in the next panel. Uh, so, is uh, is anti-establishment and populism something that's uh, causally related, or is it congruent, or is it not? Um, uh, so, many questions remain open. Thank you very much for that, <laughs> and thank you very much for the <laughs>